Nice to be here. Um, first time in London. Nice to be here for a conference. I mean, at least I have something to do. Um, I'm Marco. Um, you may know me as a Chromius on the internet. My primary job is annoying people on Twitter, on Reddit, and everything else. As a side job, I am a software developer. Um, this is the avatar for those who have more like image memory. I work for a company called Rove. We are consultants, so we come in your company and we either mess it up or fix it. Depends on the roll of a dice. Um, uh, I'm part of the Zen Framework team, and I am part of the Doctrine team. So I'm pretty much the guy that you have to blame if Doctrine is so slow in releases. Um, OK, so we're talking about Doctrine project. I have to introduce the project first. Uh, we are a group of persistence-oriented projects. I want to make this very clear, because a lot of people like just think Doctrine and always DRM. No, it's a lot of projects. Um, and we pretty much deal with everything that has to do with loading and saving stuff. So we are looking for contributors. If you think you have some experience in loading, saving stuff, I mean, has anybody not done it? <laughs> OK, uh, just poke me. You must be prepared to take like very unpopular decisions. It's about saying no rather than just merging stuff, OK? So, but feel free to poke me, and I'll gladly like wire in the team if you think you want to help out and be useful. So we are talking about Doctrine RM in this talk for how many here use it? How many do not use it? How many totally hate it? It's perfectly legit. OK, that's fine. OK, I, I hate it as well. So. <laughs> um, it's a JSR 317, which is pretty much just like RPSRs, kind of, except it's done by people that know their stuff. Just kidding. Uh, it's Hibernate inspired, so I have to mention Hibernate because Hibernate is actually the project we kind of like took ideas from. And it's um, GPL based, so we have to mention them. Besides that, they're awesome. They know what they do. So just cheering them. Um, and we're talking about best practices specifically. So best practices, this is mostly a rant. I realize that, but we'll see about that. We have some good and constructive suggestions in here. It's not just about how not to do it. So first of all, when you start with Doctrine, you need to know the enemy. The tool chain that you use it might actually seem useful, but it is actually the enemy. Um, you have to deal with it. So don't like throw everything in and hope that it will fix problems automatically. You need to use this thing to actually use the tool set and understand what it does. So first of all, just fix that part. Read the documentation, please. Somebody may not agree, but yeah. I think it's kind of like the central point where you want to start. And I am at fault as, uh, for this as well. I started using Doctrine. I remember I didn't read the documentation. I just started and used it from some example that I saw, started using it. And then at some point, I wasn't understanding and went into reading the code. I mean, I took a lot of shortcuts that were actually not really shortcuts. So please read it. It's not the nicest documentation, but if you want to help out again, please poke me. So first of all, you need to make sure that you are using the ORM in the appropriate context. Uh, one thing that I see is that people just start a project and they say, oh, it's a Symfony project. It's going to be like standard like that, or uh, it's a Laravel project. I'm going to start and use that approach. Everyone kind of misses the point that the project is around the business part, and it's not about doctrine or Symfony or Laravel. It's about what you need to build for the business to work. So think about that first. What is Doctrine for? Uh, so first of all, Doctrine is designed around this thing. This is OLTP, Online Transaction Processing. This means pretty much kind of like take the shopping cart, add an item, commit. Take the shopping cart, add an item, commit. That is an online transaction. or take the shopping cart, check out, commit. You see, it's really tiny stuff every time, little tiny actions, and we execute them. And that is what online transaction processing is. It allows us to pretty much enable DDD concept. That is kind of a lie, but um, just to, it, it kind of enables you to do some DDD to some extent. 
Um, I'm not sure if there were any DDD talks. I didn't really follow on that. Uh, but you should follow up on that. Um, there's a great mailing list that you should follow if you are interested in the topic. It's DDD in PHP.org. Um, so just go and get subscribed because it's really useful. You just throw in your problem and people start reasoning about it, which is really good. And remember, it's not about your Laravel or Symfony or Zen Framework or whatever problem. It's about your business problem. OK, it's a library for fast prototyping. This means that you start and throw stuff in. You code your objects. You keep going with use cases and use cases. And the database is just a detail. So you have to deal with this. If you have like some people telling you this is the database, and you need to work with it, then probably Doctrine is not the right tool already for that. Okay, So I'm already excluding a lot of use cases that I'm fairly sure at least 30% in here are kind of using repeatedly over their job. Okay, Just think about it. Every time you have one of those uses, use cases, like external uh, database that is predefined, you probably don't want to have Doctrine anyway. Object-oriented first. Again, if you don't want object-oriented, then don't use it. And it's very important to not use Doctrine in a few use cases. Dynamic data structures, like kind of like MongoDB style, you have mixed data, or Magento. Who uses Magento? Who tried to map it to the Doctrine system? Well, at least that not. But um, the idea is that you don't want to have like these structures with entity attribute values or uh, mixed data or data that is no and then is zero and then is a string and then is a number changes every time. It's about being strict about types. Um, you want to have your clear object structure, so uh, you have to have very well defined data structure inside your mental model first. You can't just throw in mixed data. It's not for reporting. This is where pretty much everyone complains. Oh, it's so slow. Okay, it's not about reporting. There is an amazing language that is kind of becoming popular. Uh, they started using it some in the recent years, somewhere in the 70s, and it's called SQL. Okay. <laughs> it is a query language, so use it for that, please. Okay, there is SQL for that. Don't use Doctrine for that. So let's go with some more constructive stuff. This I, I realize it's kind of like a sad intro, sad trombone intro. Entities, of course. We start from the entities. Um, first thing that needs to be clear is that the entities are part of how you reason about the problem, and they're not part of how the ORM reasons about the problem. So your entities should, first of all, work without the ORM. So you should code them first, make them work, and Doctrine is, for now, outside your problem space. It will bring problems in later, OK? <laughs> You will have trouble. But first of all, start writing without the ORM in mind. It should work without the database. Can you design a system that just serializes objects into a, like a file and deserializes them and makes it work? Have you ever tried that as an exercise? Uh, you know, Just take your typical blog post, article, whatever example, and instead of storing it into a database table, just store it in a TXT file as serialized data. Give it a try. Can you do that? Does it work? If it works, then maybe it's OK. If it doesn't, then it means that you're already coupling with the database. <laughs> Might be a choice, but then you probably are designing it not the way you should use this tool. Um, entities mostly represent your domain, so you are talking about concepts inside the problem space of your business. Whereas the ORM and the database are just for loading and saving stuff. They are not important. Okay, everyone just starts designing tables and stuff like that. You should instead design the entities first. You start designing these problems, how they interact with each other, okay, and then the database comes after it. So the database is actually a side effect of having these problems. You design the problem, and then the solution comes after that kind of automatically which is, again, a false promise, but all right. Which means that also the mapping stuff, like annotations and all this stuff, depending whether you want to use annotation, XML, or I don't know, YOLO, YAML, whatever, uh, you should pretty much design the mappings after that. Let's start with designing some entities. 
Uh, this is pretty familiar, right? So who writes this kind of entity? Yeah? Yeah? Right? Don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is pretty much a user object, username, password, set username, uh, get username, get password, set password, PHP 7 type hints, fancy stuff, but this is not really useful. This is an array with type hints. There is nothing useful in this. Entities are not typed arrays. That is what a record is. A record doesn't have any interaction with the real world. It's just data. An entity instead is a representation of the problem inside your business, kind of. So entities instead have a behavior. So you want to go into the object-oriented API. You have to think about how objects talk to each other instead of what the objects contain. So instead of saying, thinking about the problem, what does the user contain, you can think about uh, a problem such as, like, um, can the user tell me his username? Okay, you just turn it into like things that you can ask to objects rather than things that you can actually store in objects. You don't think about the state, you think about the interactions that you can have with them. It's just a bit of a shift in how you think about the API. Um, how the internal state is designed is irrelevant. And if you actually start designing internal state, you are going to have a lot of hidden coupling inside your objects, which is just kind of, kind of causing some problems later on. We'll see that. Uh, so you can design any state after that. You can think of it as like writing public methods that are empty, that don't do anything, and then writing the tests. The tests fail. And after you make the tests pass, you have defined how the data is saved inside your objects. So you can move the data around however you would prefer. Um, yeah, it leads to terrible coupling. If you start thinking of your entities as records, you are going to be frozen into this mindset of the database kind of, orient uh, kind of oriented API. You can move things around. You can decouple it. You can move things around. It's not a big deal. So here's a better example of the user object. So a user object has some state. We're going to skip on that. Then here's an interesting one. This is a good suggestion, I would say. We have a two nickname. Now, two nickname is not really different from get nickname or get username. But the, the idea is that we are not getting some state. We are transforming the object into something else. So it's, you could call it a cast in that case. It's more of a psychological thing rather than an actual change in the API. We're still getting some state practically, but from the outside, it doesn't look like we're getting some state. We're transforming it into something else. We have an authentication method, so we can authenticate with a password, a callable, which is maybe some password hash compatible API. Uh, and then we have a change password. Change password, which does rehash the password with some callable, which again hashes the password. So this is kind of a way to, you see, we're avoiding setting things. We're telling the object what to do. And the object may even reject these interactions. We may just say, you know, your data is not good. Just throw an exception. If you don't need any behavior, if you don't have any behavior, you don't need an ORM. It's most probably just going to cause you more problems than what you're solving. OK? So respect the law of Demeter. Anybody familiar with the law? Well, anybody not familiar with the law of Demeter? No sh not shy, not problem, OK? So the law of Demeter is, I, I prefer explaining it with a game. Um, there is this game which I don't know the name in English, to be honest. Um, you do it in kindergarten, well, when you're a kid, you say a word to the next person, and the next person says it to the another person, and so on and so on. And you throw in lion on one side, and snake comes, on, comes out on the other, completely other side. Sorry? Chinese whispers. Oh, thank you. I'm going to write it down. Um, that is what the law of Demeter is about. So instead of like having these big chains of things like that you call, uh, you avoid that and you just talk to your direct neighbor, and that's it. Okay. Otherwise, you get all these chain calls, which I don't know if it was Marek here. Did you call it a train wreck? I don't remember. But yeah, chain calls. If you look at them, it looks exactly like a train wreck. It's, it kind of is. So here we have an example. 
It's kind of subtle, but here's what we have. We have a user. So we coded the interaction. So we have a method which is has access to. So this user pretty much allows us to check a resource for access control. So what we do is we filter all the access levels accessible to the role that is assigned to this user. And then we check whether that particular access level guarantees me access to that resource. So this is my check. So what I'm doing here is I'm traversing the graph. I'm jumping one time to roll. And then I'm jumping another time and get the access levels. And then I assume the access levels are in a particular data structure that I know. And then for every access level, I'm assuming I'm, I'm going to um, execute an operation. So this is a typical Demeter violation. It's a bit hidden, but you should just stop here. You should have stopped here. So you can just refactor it out, and you change it like that. So your role now has the responsibility of telling whether your user has access or not. So this is just one suggestion, but it makes it so much easier to reason about the problem. Uh, it is actually shifting away stuff. You're still going to have this loop somewhere else. But you only have one level of jumping through state. OK, we are avoiding interacting with state. Uh, it is much more expressive, I mean, arguably. It is much easier to test. You can mock it out. You can do whatever you prefer there. Uh, you have less coupling. You have only one level. You have only imports from one class and not from the contents of that class. It's much more flexible. You can replace it. And it's much easier to get rid of it. So that leads to pretty much the same uh, kind of like conclusion there. You pretty much disallow any access to uh, the collections inside your entities from outside. So here's we, here we have another example. So our user has a list of buns. OK, this is obviously accessing again with the getter approach, but it's just an example for the sake of the example here. So we access the bands, and then we have somewhere a command handler, a controller, whatever this is, okay, a listener, whatever this is, which bans a user by ID. So what I'm doing is I'm getting the user from the repository, and uh, then I'm getting the bands of a user, and I'm adding a ban. Okay, I'm banning that user. You see that there's some fiddling around here? So what happens is that I'm just modifying the state of the collection, which is by reference contained inside the user. So I'm modifying like the state through different indirection levels. And that makes it really, really hard to debug when something goes wrong. So what you do is you keep them hidden. You never expose them, or you cast them or dereference them. So what you can do is you can just cast a collection to array. So here, instead of returning a collection, you either return a new collection or you return a, an array, which is dereferenced, so you don't allow any modification on that object. Or what you can do is you indeed transform it into an interaction. So your user now can be banned. You can ban him, well, or mark as banned, whatever. And then you just call it like that. So you see, we're removing indirection levels. Again, it's pretty much, again, similar to the previous law. Entity validity. Who does entity validate? Yeah. I did it as well, so it's not a big deal. You shouldn't really do that. It's not really something that should ever happen. Why did your entity get to an invalid state? There is no invalid state. OK, sorry, my slides get chucked, chunked on this. but. Entities should always be in a valid state. You should always have valid state inside of an entity after construct. Okay? There should never be any invalid data in that. Anything that is like data that is kind of like squishy, you're not sure if it's valid or if it's invalid, it may change over time, and the validity may change over time, you just move it to a different concept. Move it into a completely separate object. What you can do is you can create an object which is like a user from input form, for example, which may be valid or invalid over time, depending on how the data is populated into the user. But then when you have the user entity, that's it. It's valid. You can't push any more invalid data into it. 
Because once it got into the persistence of your system, it's just a moving bug. You save an object, and one year later, it causes a bug. That, ha that happens a lot of times. So this applies to any kind of temporary state, anything that is like transient, and you don't really know when it's going to be valid. Just create a data transfer object, a new object that has these rules about validity. And once you can convert it into valid state, then it can become an entity. So you stay valid after construct, regardless of what the database says. It has to be valid after construct. And there is a very quick solution to avoid having BC breaks on the constructor, which is pretty much added name in, uh, adding name it constructors everywhere, which means you have a public static function from form data, public static function from serialized state, public static function from API uh, data, something like that. So you keep adding those methods instead of modifying the constructor every time your requirements about input data change. You just add a new method and a different way of building the object. Since we keep the state valid and we avoid interactions about state, this means that these things also go away. We don't deal with setters anymore. So um, a setter doesn't really mean anything anyway. So just get rid of it. Yeah. So um, since we say that we can like say from API data, from form data, and so on, we can also get to some more strict rules about this, uh, which are pretty much avoiding any coupling with the application layer. Now, coupling with the application layer is bad for you because you are coding an application that will work for six months, and that's OK, but it may also work for 20 years. OK. And the framework that you're using may not be supported anymore in 20 years. How many people have a framework that has been online for 20 years? How many people use JavaScript and have to change that every week? Eh? Huh? Um, seriously, just don't couple with the application layer. This means that regardless if you like Laravel now, or Symfony now, or some framework now, just don't think in the box. Okay? You have to keep it out of your core logic. So here we have two kind of bad examples. One is we have a user controller that has a register action, and then we have the user form binding to a new user. So we have two violations here. One is, why can I create an empty user? I, what is the date in the user? Why is the user valid in this state? I didn't provide any ID. I didn't provide any username. So the user, in this case, already violates the rule about the constructor. After construct, it must be valid. And in second place, I have this form, which interacts directly with the state of the user, which makes it really, really, really squishy. And what happens in those cases is that people start to modify the user to make the form work. Instead of adapting the form to the user, they do the opposite. You start adding getters and setters because the form changed and has more fields or the fields changed. The other one is a bit better. So what we do is we just save a user from form data given a form. Now, this one is much better, but you still have some coupling, because inside the from form data, which is inside the core logic of your application, you will have a type hint against some kind of object which comes from the framework, which means that when you upgrade, you will have to rewrite this method which may be fine, but it is a dependency, and things will go wrong when you have to change the system. So form components are bad, OK? All right. Both Symfony form um, and Zen form are totally terrible, like both of them. There's no exclusion. All the form components are terrible at this. There are solutions to that, which um, are to use a data transfer object again. So what you do is. Well, anybody using Symfony or Zen Framework? Yeah? I'm sorry, I'm not really familiar with the Laravel form system there. But uh, in Symfony and Zen Form, you take an object, you bind it to the form, and then the form does its magic, kind of like how it works. What you can do is, instead of having a, the entity bound to the form, you create this secondary object, this data transfer object, which we talked about before, which can have this invalid state. And you push anything in there. You start adding fields to that, remove fields from that, and so on. And then you push all the data there. 
And then you create the entity after that from this data transfer object. So once the data transfer object says, OK, all the data is here, we now can convert it into an entity. All right, lifecycle callbacks. Um, I generally tell to avoid them uh, so because lifecycle callbacks are pretty much a persistence hack. Now, who uses them? Again, I know there's a lot, that's a lot of people. Again, there are legit use cases for them. But you can think of a lifecycle callback as serialized and unserialized, but database specific. Okay? You don't want to save, I don't know, a big image inside the entity. You want to store it in S3, a video, or something like that. Kind of edge cases. You probably don't want to deal with it in the ORM, but you probably don't want to land that stuff inside your database. Instead, you just use lifecycle callback, move stuff around, and make it work somehow. What happens is that a lot of people uh, cause business, uh, business um, interactions inside these lifecycle callbacks. Now, think about it. Would you ever implement an object which is JSON serializable? Okay, which means you call JSON serialize and it calls that method on your object, and that sends an email every time I serialize an object. Does that make any sense? That is exactly what happens when you implement business logic inside the lifecycle callback. It's exactly the same logic. So kind of avoid them for that stuff. There are use cases, but they are instead the serialized and unserialized specific to ORM contexts. So keep that in mind. Uh, right, avoid auto-generated identifiers. Now, this goes back to this example, this user object. Like, when I build this, like, does it have an identity? It's an entity, right? An entity, by definition, is pretty much a container of stuff, and it has an ID assigned to it. That is what an entity is. So um, every time you have an entity with auto-generated identifiers on a database, this means that your entity will not have an ID until after you saved it to the, da uh, to the database. Okay? This means that you can like just create the object, and it is not having any, an ID. This is invalid state, okay? So it's obviously violating one of the rules that I said before. You will have also some kind of pitfalls. So you are going to have blocking operations between each other. So when you have like inserts related to each other, you have to wait for this insert to be finished before you can do that insert. And then you need the next insert, and so on and so forth. So you have kind of operations that are blocking each other. That is not relevant, because the uh, doctrine system doesn't really currently allow bulk inserts. We are working on it. But if you code with auto-incremental identifiers, we cannot do bulk in inserts, because we need to loop through every insert and get the last inserted identifier in order to populate it back into your object and make it valid. So your ORM is already fixing your data there for you. and Data is appearing by magic, which is kind of also one of the things that, interestingly, is confusing newcomers. I mean, it makes sense for everyone that used the ORM for a period of time, but at, for the newcomers, they ask, where does this ID come from? And it also is a very good question. You can't do very complicated multi-request transactions, so you can't create an object and then say, keep it on the side, and then I'm going to do some other stuff, and then I'm going to commit it later. So you also have some problems there. And again, validity. And interestingly, your object doesn't work without the database. So now you cannot write the example that I asked you to kind of think about before, where you just create an object, store it into a TXT file, and make it work. There is a simple solution to that. What you can do is you just use a UUID. So what you do is you create uh, just a very big integer. That's what a UUID is. For those who store UUIDs as 36 charters somewhere, because they do it. Um, so what you do is just this. That's how you implement it. And it's as simple as that. There's a library uh, built by Ben Ramsey. And 
it works awesome, and that's how you use it. It's as simple as that, and you can put it everywhere. And I'm currently designing all my new systems with that, and it's just amazing. You're simplifying the problems by a lot with very minimal overhead. Um, you can pretty much say, oh yeah, but now I have the IDs that are not sortable. I can sort them because a UID is pretty much a random number. It's a very random number. To give you an idea of how random it is, um, if you kept generating UUIDs for 100 years with a million UUIDs per second, you would probably have 50% of a chance of having one collision. Okay, that's how random a UUID is. So you can safely use them um, as a replacement for any kind of sequence. Instead, you just pretty much can get rid of this and you just add a daytime field somewhere. <laughs> okay, so we simplify the IDs as well. Uh, now what we can do is we can also um, simplify this sequence problem, we just add daytimes, but we can also simplify identifiers in general. So let's get rid of derived primary keys. So this is a normalization thing. In databases, you tend to normalize stuff. So every time you have a field which is part of a primary key, but references another field, that's where you have a derived primary key. So you just get rid of it. This pretty much means that in the ORM, you don't use any field that is an ID, and it is a 2-1 association. Just don't do it. It doesn't really bring you anything. Just create a new surrogate field um, and store it there. That's perfectly OK. For the other field, you just create a unique constraint, and then you deal with the duplication problems at application level, and you let it crash if it goes back to the database. But there is no real reason to have the right primary keys except normalizing because the book told you to do that. You don't need to have everything in third normal form. There is no point in doing that. Um, and what you should do is every time you tend to normalize too much, you should think about whether it actually brings something from a business perspective. Does the business actually need it? Do you need any normalization there? Or are you just doing it because you like the nice normalization problem of databases in general? So the same for composite primary keys. Composite primary keys, which is pretty much just a primary key spanning over more than one field or column, they're pretty much not necessary. OK, just don't use them. Uh, this is obviously not a 100% rule, OK? I'm not, I'm not telling you, oh my god, this guy is going, going completely crazy. He's telling us not to use primary keys as they were designed to be used. I'm just telling you how it works better in this context. You just assign an ID on your own, and everything else is just a constraint. And you make it fail if you try to insert duplicate data in the database, but you don't deal with the unique constraint problem inside the application. OK, is there any reason not to just use a surrogate field. No, it's just an optimization that you're doing here, there, and it's just complicating how you fetch data and save data inside your database. Um, does it really make a difference from a domain perspective? Not really, in most cases. If it does, then do it, but in most cases, you don't really have this problem. All right, so I'm kind of slowing down here. Um, favor immutable entities. Uh, one thing that is really cool that you can do is in Doctrine 2.5, there's this component which is called the second level cache. Just kind of enable it and it kind of makes things faster. Sometimes. But uh, what you can do is you can pretty much just either make entities immutable or design data structures in such a way that they are append only. Here's a, an example. So you have a private message inside, I don't know, message board or whatever. And then you have a from, a to, a message, and a read, which is an array, a collection of who read that message. So what you do is you construct this object, and then you have an interaction which says read, and the user reads the message. So every time you have an interaction with read, you are simply going to create a new message read, OK? And that's it. And message read looks like this. It doesn't have any interaction. Or, well, it may have getters eventually, or you may have some kind of serialization for it. But that's it. You create an object, you push it to the collection. So this is an append-only data structure. It is going to grow over time, but it's not a big deal. 
because to be honest, we got enough hard drive space and databases are really efficient at dealing with lots of data. But it is really, really simple. You keep appending. Instead of saying, yeah, message read, it goes from false to true, you just keep appending. So you know who read it. So you're also having an auditing log as a side effect. And you may also apply different business rules, like how many times was it read? Or when was it read the first time? This object may just store a date time when it was created. Kind of useful, right? Immutable data is really simple to reason about. And uh, I can cache it forever. Since it's not going to change, I can just plug in the caching component here. And any data coming from that, assuming it's in my cache, I'm never going to query it again. So my database doesn't need to be queried again ever for that particular kind of entry. Um, it is predictable. You can kind of do predictions based on previous data. You can see how data is going to, in which direction you're going, if it's going up, down, whatever you want to do. Um, and you can do historical analysis. I mean, counting or seeing who inserted first a record, stuff like that. So it's really, really useful. You may look at different concepts for that. There are even other components that are not DRM that allow you to do event sourcing. There's even dedicated storages for that, but that's for another talk. Avoid soft deletes. Soft deletes are kind of a broken concept. Uh, they come from an age where everything had to stay in one database. Everything had to stay in one database because of performance issues, because you had 700 tables in the same database, and I'm fairly sure everyone here has one or two projects with that. Uh, but they bring a big problem with them. First of all, they break some immutability. So you're not really having immutable data. You just have this data that changes instead of just disappearing. It really changes. But you break data integrity. Now you have foreign keys referencing some data that may not exist anymore because it's soft deleted, but it's not really deleted. So now you have like kind of a broken association there. So all this stuff that we fought for, which is data integrity, that's why you use an RDBMS and not like something like MongoDB, depending on your use case, that's kind of gone. So what is the point? You're breaking validity as well here. So soft deletes are pretty much coming from this idea where everything has to still exist in the same database. And you cannot ever lose data. If you have this kind of problem, why not implement an audit log instead? Every time you delete something, you're going to add a record somewhere. Simple, right? It's a good solution. Does your use case really also include restoring deleted data? OK, did somebody ask you to build the feature to restore deleted data? Or are you just thinking too much forward and it's something that nobody will ever need? Or maybe you can just restore a backup. OK, I'm not even joking. You just restore a backup. It's perfectly OK sometimes. Uh, soft deletes can pretty much always be replaced by some more, uh, some concept that is more near to your use case. Uh, this is something that was interesting. Um, a company I did some consulting for last year, um, they have huge machinery. Uh, by huge machinery, I mean a single machine could fit this entire room. Okay? And they used to press metal pieces. Now what happens is that they produce 100 million pieces of this metal stuff, and then they get rid of the machine because they need the building to build another machine to make a different piece, right? You're not really deleting that machine. Where does that machinery all go? What happens is that they just take it, put it in boxes, ship it somewhere in a depot or whatever, so it's archived, right? It's a very different concept from deleted. So they use this soft delete concept to be able to like turn on and off these machines. But now they had problems where they like had like which piece was produced by which machine, and they had referential integrity issues because the machines that were soft deleted were marked as deleted and could not be referenced. So you see, we still have these problems. Instead, we replaced it with the problem of our hiving, and that was a perfect fit. You just had a little marker that said this entry. 
this machine is not active anymore. We are hived it. Very simple, right? OK, mapping driver choices. This is just necessary because I'm, I have my preferences on that. So in private packages, just use annotations. Don't go overboard. Unless you're writing software that should last for forever, you're perfectly fine with annotations. Annotations are simple to read. Any junior developer can understand how they work. Maybe he will configure them wrong a couple times. This will happen. But they work, they are simple to understand, and they're very near to the code they affect directly. For public stuff, oh, this died. For public stuff, please use XML mappings. And that is because everyone will be able to take your open source package and replace the mappings with some other mappings from a different file. So please use XML mappings for public stuff. For YAML, I'll YAML you if you use it. Don't, don't do it. Right? Really, it's a bad idea. Lazy or eager loading. Um, this is also one of those things that you should not really look at when building your system initially. I see a lot of system where you go in and you see everything marked as extra lazy by default or uh, eager by default. Don't do it. You just figure it out later while you're working on the system. Eager loading is pretty much useless. Uh, while we built it with this eager loading, eager loading is far from completely working. So the idea was that every time you have an association and you have this eager annotation or marker, um, you are going to pretty much do a join automatically, and you're going to fetch the associated data in one query. This doesn't really happen, because the ORM is far from a magic box. It is still kind of a magic box, but it's just tricks. OK, so pretty much don't use it. Extra lazy on the other side, you will have to use it in some cases. But the point of extra lazy is kind of giving you also a warning. Like here you have something that goes out of the boundaries of what an online transaction processing system should do. So now you have a collection with like a thousand items, a million items. Like think about it, you start looping over one of those collections by accident and suddenly your system crashes because there's no memory or because it loads the entire table in, inside your memory and maybe, I don't know, it goes into swapping and your system goes completely offline depending on memory limits and stuff like that. But they are high-risk areas. So every time you have extra lazy, you have to be very careful about what you're doing there. So you, you are at the limits of what the ORM can do. You should probably just stop and look at whether you still need the ORM for that particular data. And you need to be very careful about transaction size and performance in that case. Bidirectional associations, that comes directly from the manual. Just avoid them. Don't use them by default. Don't make everything be directional. So think about your use case. If you have an object referencing some parts, the parts don't need to know in which system they are. Okay? It's the object containing them. All right. They bring some overhead. You are going to hydrate data both, uh, in both directions. And that is a lot of moving stuff around that your M does for you. So you, know, you only want to code the associations that are strictly necessary to make your business logic work. It goes back to initially. You first implement the public ABI, how your objects talk to, it, to each other, and then the state internal to these objects comes after that. If you need to like, do some complex DQL queries that traverse the associations in various directions, just hack them together or use SQL. I mean, SQL is perfectly valid in, case, in this case. So what you can do is you can have custom repositories. Custom repositories will give you some very expressive API. You know exactly what you're looking at. And they're very verbose. So you have a user repository which says, find users that have a monthly subscription. There is no way somebody can read it wrong. I mean, it is really simple. And then you, ha you can have any kind of hell here. You can do SQL, DQL. MongoDB map reduce operation. You can do whatever I want, you want. You can use caching, what you want. Doesn't matter. There's another approach which I like much better lately, and that's just because of uh, kind of more functional approaches that I'm taking. Although this is not functional at all, 
uh, because of state retention, but you have an object which is users that have a monthly subscription. And you can call this many, many times, and it will just pretty much execute the query. So it's the exact same thing as this one. I just moved this method to the class name. All right, I moved it to the top. So what you do is you just simply have a single function, which is a report, and you can just open a directory and see all the different reports that you coded and what you support in your system, which is really useful. Um, repositories are services. Same as these query functions, kind of, that I've shown you. And you should treat them as that. Uh, so you have to uh, deal with the problems of service location. So you can avoid having anything to do with this thing, this get repository. Entity manager get repository is a service locator. And it is coded as a utility method to make it quick to work with. But the repositories inside your system are part of your domain logic, and they should not really come from the tool. You should inject them instead. So this kind of API has the same exact problems of, an, of a service locator. You now have an object, and you don't know if the object is exactly what you expected. So you will have some problems. Instead, you have to inject them in the constructor. Okay, Pass the repository to your constructor, and you're going to be fine. Other suggestions, um, you can se separate get and find methods. This is really, really useful. So what you do is you have two versions of the same API. With find, you can have a method that returns null. It can fail. It can return an empty array. It can do all of this. But with get, it cannot. Get is always supposed to return something. And if it doesn't return something, it should throw an exception. And it's really, really easy to implement, and it simplifies things by a lot. So this is like get by slug, and it will give you a blog post. And if it cannot find a blog post, then it will throw a blog post not found exception from the slug. Okay, it will tell you, I couldn't find a blog post by this slug. Okay, and this really simplifies things because now every consumer of the repository doesn't have to deal with the case of null. It always expects something, and the case where you don't have that particular record will throw an exception. In this case, in this particular logic, in this particular repository case, you can just catch this exception and transform it into a 404 page. For now, you can make it crash and make a 500. It's perfectly okay. But later on, if you want to make it more restish, you can do a 404. Two-phase commits, I'm going to skip on that. But uh, here's a, another suggestion that I can give you. Um, between different services that deal with similar concepts, but kind of share state, you can actually call the entity manager clear method. Now. One of the advantages of Doctrine is that since it keeps everything in memory, you're not going to repeat queries for fetching data. Now, since you have the second level cache component, this is not, not true anymore. Okay? Since you are saving and loading data, and this data goes into se the second level cache, every time you do a direct fetch, it is probably going to load from the cache. This means that you can pretty much clear at the end of pretty much every kind of code execution that is like domain logic. You execute a service method, and you just clear. This means that you don't have any transient state that wasn't saved, that is shady, that is moving around. You just avoid that. Instead, what you do is you just pass from one service to the other. Instead of passing a user object from one service to the next service, you pass the identifier of the user. OK? So you have different boundaries, like invoicing system, and I don't know, shipping system. Okay, so you have products in invoicing and products in shipping. You pass the product ID from shipping to invoicing or vice versa, the other direction. Okay, you decide how to do that. But instead of passing the product itself and sharing the same entity, you just pass IDs here and there. And this avoids any particular strange state conditions where you don't know if you can flush or not, because that happens a lot. You don't know who is responsible for flushing something. So you just pass IDs around. Simplifies by a lot. OK, keep normalization under control. 
We are talking about real-world applications. We're not trying to solve the problem of storing everything inside a perfect schema that represents the world. Okay? Every time I see these like giant object graphs of 500 entities where everything has to be its own entity and so on and so forth, just freaking make a JSON field and stuff it with stuff. Okay? That's it. It's really, really simple. Okay, so keep the normalization freaks under control. You know, like just take them and you know put them in the trash bin or something. I'm just not gonna suggest you to bully people, but seriously, tell them it's okay to pretty much store some data in not perfect database oriented approaches. All right, so you may need to gag your DBA. Okay, a better suggestion is to talk to him and let him understand your needs. We're not talking about 70s style database normalization. We're not talking about single database. And the problem is that academical and practical knowledge really differs here. You may have a super efficient ap application from a memory perspective, but then super complicated logic to make a query that is efficient. Or you can just stuff the data in a non-normalized way into your database, and it actually works. All right, about performance, there's a completely other talk about it. Uh, I'm just going to tell you where to look at when you profile. There, was some, there were some talks about xDebug. I'm not sure if it was also about profiling. Uh, but there are some hotspots that you need to check when you look for performance. So what you do is you look at the unit of work, which is pretty much everything that goes in memory goes here. You want to look at DQL, how DQL translates to a query. If you're using a paginator and the paginator is slow, instead of trying to hack the paginator, just write a custom query yourself. It works perfectly OK. OK, the paginator is a monster. It's terrible. All that code in there is done for some kind of compatibility with Oracle, DB, MS, SQL, and who knows what other engine that doesn't support SQL 92. So please don't use the paginator for everything. <coughs> repositories, custom repositories, all the way, just code custom repositories. You can make a very complicated query that doesn't really fetch the data in the format that you want, but returns the 1,000 entries that follow this 10,000 complicated business rules. Instead of doing that, you can just fetch the 10,000 identifiers and then pass them to an in query, a query with an in condition in it. All right, and the second level cache. There's an entire talk on this, but there's documentation about it. You should try it out. It is going to make a big difference on the performance of your application. So you have to profile those hotspots, and measuring is really the only way to get performance there. <coughs> So just write a feature and then profile. All right, there's other stuff about it. So to recap, since it's late, except for the keynote, I'm still holding you back here. Code domain first. Instead of thinking, oh, I'm going to use this tool or that tool or the other tool, you have to think about what the business needs. And doctrine may not be the fit for you. OK? You may even just do pure SQL-based applications. That's your preference. Do not normalize without the need for it. Normalization must be a requirement that comes from business stuff, not a requirement just for the sake of building a requirement because you want to make it nice and shiny. Okay, You're just building more problems there. And use different databases. Like Don't store everything in a single database. Audit logs are valid, logs, normal logs are valid, copying data is valid, using just backups is valid for the soft deletes problem. And the point is that transactional data is not your reporting data. Okay? What you deal with, like saving and loading shopping carts, is not necessarily the table that will be used to generate analytics reports on who bought or not what shopping cart. You don't need to store everything in the same database. All right, that's all I have for now. Thank you very much. Please just feel free to ask any questions. Uh, right. Um, there's a MongoDB version of uh, Doctrine online, but you said we shouldn't use that ARM for Mongo type of yeah. dynamic type database. No, what, what I mean is that you shouldn't have data that is not following predictable 
form. So you shouldn't have data that is like uh, an integer or a string, depending on a case by case base. That's what right. I mean. But the Mongo is actually built for that purpose, that which means is that you shouldn't use that. You shouldn't use the ORM for that. All right. The MongoDB is, is fine. MongoDB system is perfectly fine for that. You just use it document storage. You stuff it with things. Every time you fetch data, you have to validate it. Every time you fetch it, every time you store it, you have to validate it. <laughs> but that's because you're shifting the responsibility of data validation from the constraint at DB level into your application, and you're going to assume that the database layer is not changing the data, which is something that really doesn't happen in most databases because somebody is going to write a stored procedure or a trigger that does magic and so on. Thank you. Yep. Hey, thank you. What's the difference between the object manager and the entity manager? The uh, object manager is the interface implemented by the entity manager. So what we did is we extracted the interface common to the different persistence systems inside Doctrine Project. In, we, are moved the, we moved the interface into Doctrine Common, and that's some very minimal API on how to interact with the persistence layer uh, in a unit of work uh, fashion. Thank you. All right. Um, you said at the beginning, don't use ORMs for reporting. Yes. Um, and then you gave us an example of get nickname for a user. So if I wanted that nickname um, return in a reporting so sense, how, how would I do that? And w what would I use if it's not the ORM? So let, let, let's say the nickname is not composed by just a field. Oh, well. mm, yeah. yeah, let's say that the nickname is computed. What you could do is instead of using directly the same database that you're using for the transactional data, assuming that it's a very com complex computation, something like verify if password is up to date, what you can do is you just actually create a batch processing that copies the data into something else, which is more reporting friendly. What you can do is indeed, in those cases, you can use listeners, or you can use even database level triggers, that when you do operations on the database, just copy over the data into a more reporting-friendly data structure. But that is because the analytics and reporting are usually subsystems of your production system. They are not really usually part of the core domain. So what happens is that you are just writing first the application that allows you to display a nickname or verify if somebody has a database pa a password hash that needs updating, and then you have a subsystem that has the reporting on it, and that subsystem comes later. That's the point. You keep it separate, and you make sure that the data is copied over, and it has its own queries, its own optimization of the database, its own schema, depending on the requirements that you have there, instead of stuffing everything in the first database, which has completely different use cases. Right. Thanks. All right. Well, um, I think that's it. I'm gonna leave you go to the keynote and catch you hopefully at the social. <laughs>